pretty. There we go. Now let's share the screen. Here we are. So tonight we have a special guest who is going to be talking about her personal story because I think all of us can learn when we hear what others have gone through. So we're going to talk about bladder infections. We're going to talk about cystitis, uh, bladder pain syndrome. There's all kinds of topics that whatever, however we want to name it, but we'll get into uh, Amanda's story tonight and uh, how her life has been transformed. So I want to welcome Amanda Wynn. So Amanda uh, lives here in Bermuda, and this is just a little clip from her Instagram page. <laughs> I think this is a great way to introduce people, you know, these days. Um, so I love Amanda it. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> She is a skydiver, fire dancer, broker, lawyer, and a world traveler. <laughs> so tonight she's going to share of, um, a little bit of her story about what's kind of happened in her life and what's kind of going on when it comes time to her bladder. And then if there's time, maybe she can talk about uh, fire dancing and uh, skydiving at the end. <laughs> I welcome all questions. <laughs> so thanks for agreeing to come on tonight, Amanda. This is so wonderful for you to share because, you know, I think this whole topic of bladder is something that just gets ignored. And I think also in a male dominated society of medicine, um, and then until a man has had a UTI, they don't understand the pain of how this can be so so uncomfortable. So um, I'll just leave the floor open to you and let you share a little bit with others as to uh, what's been happening. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Keenan. Thank you for having me on this. And first of all, this is so great that you offer this to, you know, the general public, or I don't know if it's the general public or you have particular people, but the fact that you do this is just fantastic. And yeah, thank you. Um, I think since we met, it was so refreshing to meet a doctor who, you know, has the medical background, but is also open to holistic um, viewing of the way we treat everything, really. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm so glad our paths crossed. And yeah, I guess my background really is in terms of UTIs. Um, I have had them recurrently um, since I was 15. Um, they are definitely, my trigger is unfortunately sex, which is very annoying. Um, but yeah, I went through a whole journey of this from my first one. I knew exactly what it was because my mother gets them. And I remember I was sitting on the toilet. She was brushing her hair and I looked at her. I said, I have a UTI. <laughs> she said, how do you know? I was like, I always hear you saying it burns and this and that. I'm like, this is a UTI. And it was. Um, and then from there on out began this journey of medical journey, holistic self-development, everything, which we can definitely dive into. But yeah, I've been getting them um, for a long time. I managed to um, stop getting them uh, for the most part for two and a half years. Unfortunately, I've kind of relapsed, but we can talk all about this. Um, but yeah, how, I don't know how much you wanted me to go into detail. Did you want me to talk about everything from start to finish or should we go into the slides? Yeah, no, I think- it'd Overlapping be too much. Yeah, so I'm just gonna shut my door. Okay, just I'll be right back. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Yeah, I guess Amanda, if you can start with what it was like in the beginning, like, you know, you're 15 years old getting a lot of these infections and, you know, I'm guessing they put you on multiple courses of antibiotics. But at what point did oh, yeah. you get sent on to a specialist and how did that kind of start to evolve for you? Yeah, okay, great place to start. Um, so I, yeah, I was seeing my doctor. I got these recurrently. My grandmother gets them. My mother gets them. I get them. My sister's got them. Um, it's got to be genetic we talk about. So I was on, put on antibiotic after antibiotic after antibiotic and do you know what? I was told that, okay, this is actually ridiculous. Half the time they were an infection, half of the time they were actually painful bladder syndrome, which I'm so excited to see on your first slide because I've just learned about this because my original doctor said when it was an infection that it might be in my head. And 
I couldn't believe this. And it was so demotivating because honestly, like I almost want to cry right now thinking about it to be told that by a doctor and then go down this path of self-discovery and everything. So it wasn't until I was living in London in law school. I, so I was 22 and I was getting them so badly. I just said like, this is insane. So I reached out to a holistic doctor and honestly, my doctor never referred me to a specialist, which is insane. Um, I kind of referred myself. <laughs> so that was unfortunate. Um, and I, yeah, I just asked, I was like, I need to get to the bottom of this because I cannot live my life like this. Like you said, how painful it is. And um, yeah, so I kind of referred myself, but it was when I moved back to Bermuda, actually, at age 27. So how many years is that of dealing with it? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. And what was your next question about? Um, yeah, just was that it on the specialist? Like what age yeah, and, and, and where about you? But it's, it's so hard, you know, and that's it with when we struggle so much and, you know, often when you're told that it's in your head, but, you know, we see this again and again with multiple conditions, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, migraines, but then with things like fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, and it's very disheartening for as a physician. And, and when I even hear other physicians talk about conditions like this, we just don't understand all the pathways and mechanisms and so I think it's so important that we all, and I really try to encourage those, you know, that come on to listen is to really advocate for our health. Because if something's not feeling good in your body, then you know that there's gotta be some other answers, whether it's the traditional route or holistic, or again, you know, Dr. Google, whatever it might be this day, but not to give up, yeah. You're so spot on on that. And that's literally when I realized I felt so alone in London and it was the worst it's ever been. I remember saying, I have to be my own advocate because no one else has to experience this. And it, I took it upon myself to be like, I want every single result like from my doctor so that I can start to learn about this. The more I just researched and I, it was my only option. And then I was one that basically referred myself and yeah, it's, it is upsetting with that, but that's why it's so great to find people like you where it's the bigger approach and yeah, the holistic side as well, but goodness. Yeah. What a journey, what a journey. <laughs> so how was it when you went to the specialist? Because I think, you know, a lot of women worry what the doctor will do. And sometimes there's different invasive tests that they can do, or how far did they go with you? Yes. Awesome question. So I went to the specialist and it was so nice to hear that it wasn't in my head and that I have a combination of recurring UTIs and something called painful bladder syndrome. And I was like, Oh, yes, I feel so validated. I feel so heard. Um, it was fantastic. Um, and yeah, there were a lot of options. Um, so to be honest, even the specialist was very, it was actually quite a holistic approach as well. So the dietary, like staying away from tomatoes, for example, they're inflammatory. Um, but the offer was, you know, a, a series of things like Manos, which we can get into as well, um, which is this amazing supplement. And I'm sure we'll talk all about it. Um, but I kind of put together this regime of all these things to help myself before I took that special, the urologist, before I took him up on the offer of the invasive treatment, which is to, and I'm not a doctor, so you tell me if this makes sense. They go up your urethra and they almost like blow it up. And what it does is it, it, for some women, and I have a couple friends who this gives them relief, um, it relieves them for about six months um, from any pain. Uh, unfortunately, normally gives them a UTI when the procedure happens, <laughs> uh, which is ironic. But after that, they say it's worth it because of how often they experience it. Um, for me, I have not gone to that point yet. And I was, like you said, I Honestly, it was a fantastic two and a half years, but unfortunately I've fallen a bit into it. And it's amazing how it's so linked to the holistic approach, which is I've identified as stress. So I always have sex and a trigger. So it's sex and a wet bathing suit, sex, and I've worked out and I'm like sitting around and it's moving. Um, something I also didn't know is exactly what it is. The E. coli, like a, a general UTI basic is the E. coli going, like we're all walking around with dirty buttholes. <laughs> whether we like it or not, it's, it could be as clean. You could get it bleached. You could do whatever you want, but those mic, those micro, those little E. coli, they're there and they're fine there. 
but it's once they move up to the urethra and they climb up is where they shouldn't be and causes the issue for the UTI side. Um, I didn't even know that. And that was something that blew my mind when I started researching for d and these other um, supplements. But yeah, that was, it was good. So I still am not doing the hard procedures. I've been, I actually was a lawyer and I left my career as a lawyer, which helped me get rid of the UTIs because the stress was too much. Um, and I, I literally changed my entire life. I centered it around what does my bladder need? So UTIs have literally changed my life, but for the better, I'm so much healthier for it. I've literally had this list. This wasn't even for tonight, but I have this, like, what do I, it keeps me guided about like practical and spiritual. Like it's like the physical logistics of the underwear I wear. So thongs can move it around to, um, yeah, the, or like the supplements we we're talking about maintenance of sleep, um, and just my alignment with myself when I'm aligned, everything, you know, the, the UTIs and the bladder pain aren't there. And unfortunately the last year things haven't been aligned. So that's why I can feel them coming back. Um, but I'm getting back on track. <laughs> so doing, I'm just amping things up to get back to where I was. Well, I like Amanda though, how you have that list of you've, you know, you've taken it on yourself, you've identified your triggers, but you know what works in your body. And I think this comes back to it again and again in healthcare is that many times we don't listen to our bodies enough. We, we try to look for this thing to fix that and something else to fix that. But we realize that it is one, we're one big organism and that there's some fundamental principles that will work. And then that will help to realign everything. Um, and, and like you said, using your bladder as your gauge, you know, often we talk about, I talk about the barometer. So I, I used to get this, um, an, I had pro ache in my knee as I was going through perimenopause. And whenever that ache would come up, I was like, well, I know I didn't do anything to my knee, but it, it became my barometer of how well I was doing with managing my hormones as I went through perimenopause. And so- wow. The only time the knee bothers me now is if I'm really off track, you know, with my, like you said, nutrition and sleep and stress. And so often that's what we can have. So your barometer is your, is your gut, but it's like so many others, you know, their barometer might be a migraine headache, or maybe it's when they have a flare up of acne, but it's that little trigger, right? It's like that little signal that says, okay, get your, get your life back into that balance. It's so spot on. And it's nice to hear what yours is too. I'm sure everybody on this call has their own version of it. Like, where do you carry your stress is what I see it as. Like I have friends that it's in their back and they know when they get stressed or things are not aligned, they're like, oh, there it is again. Like you have to listen to it. That's something I've just been really working on listening to my body and like meditation is something I picked up and I know it's a huge fad now, but it is amazing. And just to be like, we're living such a busy world, but just to sit there silently and just like listen to your body. And sometimes apart from meditating, I do mindfulness, which I see it as very different. I actually almost it's the opposite of meditation, which is to be still. But for me, my mindfulness practice is to engage with my body and talk to it. Like even just sometimes ask it, like, how are you? What do you need? And the answers almost come back to you, but yeah, that's, um, yeah, it's really good to hear that other people have their different barometers, but yeah, mine is my bladder. I'm literally guided by my bladder. <laughs> but I love that, like you said, the practice of mindfulness, you know, it's asking, it is given. And sometimes if we, if we are, if we can take the time to sit still and then listen, then the body will start to respond. Like, um, I, I keep talking about Gabor Mate, but he's a doctor from Western Canada and, you know, the body keeps score. And so the body yeah. is telling us. <laughs> Isn't that a book? Is that a yeah. book as yeah. well? Yeah. Yes. I love that. Literally. So for me, like I said, you know, medically, yes, you can get anxiety, like, or not anxiety, sorry, goodness, a whole other topic. <laughs> you could get a UTI. Let's like, if it's pushed up, it's going to happen, you know, but for me, what I find is that, like I said, my first trigger is sex. If I am good on sleep, nutrition, um, gosh, I don't even, everything that like I've listed here, then I'll be okay. But if I have sex and then so I've, I, oh, this is a big one. I ate too much sugar. Boom. I'm going to 
get a UTI. I, had, oh, I got a, a bit less sleep last night. Boom, UTI. So there's always that two part. So it's like it's going to happen. It's going to continue. But what I can control is the secondary trigger. And once those are all aligned, then it's very like I gosh, I think I almost went three years actually without a UTI. Um, but it forces me again, that barometer. I'm like, you didn't sleep. Get your sleep. You finding out my food allergies. That was a game changer, too. That helped. Um, what else? The water intake. I now, this is great. I forced myself <laughs> to drink four liters a day. I feel like I'm drowning myself. But it helps. So all these things, no caffeine. I don't touch coffee, tea. And it sounds all radical, especially if, you're, if people are on and this is like an issue for you. It sounds like, oh my gosh, I could never do that. The, you can and you get to a point where you won't tolerate it anymore because for me I said oh I, I eat alcohol too I barely drink it's like reserved for like twice a year and then I know I might get a UTI <laughs> but you know making these huge lifestyle changes it doesn't happen overnight but the more like you said that barometer if you listen to it you're rewarded you're like oh I went to bed early last night and had a great night's sleep or um, yeah, I drank all my water or I'm sticking to my tr- nutrition. Um, yeah. You think of it as a reward. Cause otherwise if you take away things like, oh, I can't eat this. You have to see what can you eat? Like for me, I found out I'm allergic to cow's milk and I'm like, well, I can, I can't wait to eat that. You drink that goat's milk, you know, then you're like a line and you won't be too hard, but yeah, these things take a while, but it's for me. Him, like with when I was okay, serious happened. So and here we are with my two liter bottle. <laughs> it is actually this big. <laughs> so two of those a day. <laughs> Perfect. Well, maybe what we'll do is we'll start some of the slides and then I'll let you kind of comment in and we'll kind of go back and forth a little bit. Um, you know, for me, even I, I must admit, you know, being a GP for a long time and I would see some but working in the ER department, I would see this occasionally, but since I've come to Bermuda, this has been a problem that I am seeing again and again. Uh, this whole concept of recurrent UTIs and also recurrent UTIs combined with vaginal infections. And so we'll kind of get to the link between those two a little bit, um, a little bit as we get started. So let me just um, turn this on here. Can I ask you, Mm-hmm. Is that Bermuda? I think it's to do with the environment. Is this you've seen a difference in like the Bermudian population versus where you're from, like in Canada or elsewhere you've been? Yeah, I'm not. Sh- this is it. I actually want to start. I want to spot, speak with the specialist because uh, to me it seems much greater than anything I'd seen a- in Canada. I wonder environment. So a few things. What do we have in Bermuda? Number one, we drink water from the roof. But a lot of times that water is not the cleanest, but also it has lime in it, which is going to change the pH a little bit. Um, Mm -hmm. But I think one of our bigger things, Amanda, in Bermuda may be the fact that we have so much mold around. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that when we look at all the many links as to what's going on, right, with this. Yep. Because, you know, Bermuda, sure, every, like, you know, we wear bathing suits and bikinis, but, you know, every people still wear bathing suits in different parts of the world. And that's not always it. Um, so there's, there's definitely some things, but the other is over, just like you said, over the last, um, over the last year, everybody's had so much more stress, right? The stress level of the planet has gone up and sadly, you know, even though COVID is down now, we might have a world war on our door. So we still have a lot of stress. And so that has a huge impact on any type of chronic illness, right? Our body begins to feel that and to sense it. Um, so is that another reason that's kind of adding to this, um, this whole kind of mixture of stress, you know, the environment that we live in, and then, you know, the poor diets that actually came along with the whole last year too, right? Because so many people with COVID were, you know, eating, you know, comfort food eating because they were in lockdown and everything else. So, yep. Interesting. Okay, so let's get started. So we've got, so UTIs, and we'll chat a little bit more. So I think most people on the call probably have had one in their life. <laughs> um, it's still the one thing in Emerge. If I saw a chart, I remember, 
if I saw just a quick chart of a woman that came in and often they get triaged a level four, you know, if, you, in the, if you've been to the hospital. So it's like one to five, but I would so pick up their chart because I know the pain of a bladder infection and the quicker you get an antibiotic in, the better it's going to make it. Um, so why do we get bladder infections? And I think you kind of went over these, Amanda. I think you talked about the basic ones. Um, the one thing with sex is also spermicides. And this is going to come back. So anyone that's using any, you know, condoms, uh, maybe you didn't think about that, that have any extra chemicals in them, because that can be also one of our, these are our traditional triggers, right? For UTIs. Um, I didn't put food in there, but you're right. Sugar should probably be in as one of those traditional and, and alcohol. But then, um, so when we think about this and we get back to the anatomy, and that's the thing that you spoke about. So everybody remember that we have a little tiny urethra, okay? And so what's happening is these bacteria, these guys get in, they go up this little urethra into the bladder, and then all these bugs start to populate, and then they go up into the kidneys. So you can get a kidney infection, um, sometimes even in addition to a bladder infection. But remember, the bacteria come from the skin or the rectum. It's a very tiny spot down there. And like you said, uh, it doesn't take a big distance to travel from the rectum to the urethra. So this is a lot of the, the basics of um, the first thing that we think about for the bladder, okay? But then we have to think about what are these other issues that are going on? Because I'm sure you did all the things, right? You drank the water, you peed after sex, and then you still kept getting bladder infections for the next like eight years. <laughs> Story of my life. <laughs> <laughs> so some of these are some of the, some can be easier to correct, right? So one of the first ones I brought up was over treatment or under treatment. Okay. So I was so happy that you said you started getting copies of your reports. And this is what I say to a lot of women. Sometimes, you know, we have many antibiotics that are out there now, uh, but sometimes that antibiotic doesn't kill the bug you have. Okay. So that can sometimes be an easy win. If you were given SEPTRA, but you know, most of the time we do what's called a culture and sensitivity. So that means we send your urine to the lab, they grow it on a plate in the, in the lab and they say which antibiotic works. And if you've been having more than one in bladder infection, you should always ask for to get a culture and sensitivity report because you wanna make sure if they gave you Bactrim, Bactrim worked. Because these days we see a lot more antibiotic resistance. Um, you know, sometimes we're seeing it to Bactrim or Septra or Macrobid or even Cipro. It actually surprises me quite a bit when I see the sensitivity, the certain bugs that are there. And of course, anybody that has a lot of, if you have other underlying medical issues, sometimes you get these really weird bugs that start to grow. And then again, it, it really depends on, did you get that bug treated with the antibiotic? So then a lot of this other stuff may be things that you have not heard about before. And I must admit, Amanda, that I knew about biofilms when biofilms, uh, when we talk about the gut, because biofilms um, basically can also seed themselves away in the gut. And then that can be a reason why people end up with leaky gut and that they don't get better. But I did not know, um, I'm still a doctor. I love this sometimes, which is why this topic I wanted to discuss it because it's like, I did not know that we can also get biofilms in our bladder, right? So tell me what you know about biofilms, Amanda. Yeah, I mean, I learned about it only because of a product which I, I'm now on called Eucora. We can discuss as well as we go on, but um, yeah, my research, it was like biofilms, it's almost, I mean, you probably know more than me, but what they described it as, it's like a thin layer of gunk, I guess, that's like lines the bladder um, or the gut, uh, probably. And so the bacteria can get into it and hide in there, and then it won't be taken out by the antibiotic. So then you end up with the antibiotic clears out all the, the naughty guys that are in there. Uh, doing all, making all this pain, doing all this destruction, and then they get cleared out by the antibiotic, but the ones are, that are hidden in the biofilm can like come back out and then repopulate. Um, so that's my understanding, but I am not a doctor, <laughs> but. 
that is a great understanding that that's what's going on and you know there's still a lot um that this is quite new this whole concept of biofilms and how they're working within our body and why we're getting so much different resistance and that's why even so you can have a bladder infection and sometimes you can even get the urine so you get the bladder infection and you say okay i'm going to go in two weeks later uh and maybe this has happened amanda and the and you get the urine report because you want to make sure it's all clear once you were on the antibiotic. And then within two or three weeks, you got another bladder infection again, right? Because that bug, okay. it was hiding away. And so those antibiotics never made the difference. Yep. I've had it happen a couple of times. And I thought, I said, is this the biofilm that I was reading about? I think only twice since I had started that. But yeah, it was definitely, a, you know, a question of mine and wondering if that's what was going on. So actually I'll go to this slide. I should have changed the order a little bit here, but so here's a little bit of what these biofilms are like, right? So you can have a free floating bacteria. So the bug, and this is from Eucora, I think their website, um, but you can see the bug is just floating around in the, in the bladder. But when they get this biofilm, it's basically, you know, it's like clumping them all together. It's kind of like the glue out of, what was Ghostbusters, you know? <laughs> Remember they would spit out that stuff and it would go, be really sticky you know, all over the yeah. And this is the sort of thing that we're seeing with these biofilms. So um, this can be another reason we get. Now, the other one I wanted to talk a little bit about, because we'll go through the whys and then we'll go through more of the treatments, but the whole vaginal microbiome, okay? Mm -hmm. So many people have never even heard of this term. So most of you on the call probably know, you've heard of probiotics, okay? And many people probably heard about the microbiome, which is what's in the gut. Well, we actually have this biome of bacteria that live in every orifice of our bodies, okay? We have it in our mouth. We know that the oral microbiome can cause dental infection, like um, cavities. We know that the oral microbiome can be associated with cases of Alzheimer's disease in our brains. We all kind of knew that we have bacteria in our nose, remember, and everyone thought COVID because that was the main entry route for COVID. But we have this bacteria that live in our vaginas, okay? And what happens, like we know, the vagina, the urethra, and the anus, they are all really close together, number one. So I sent you a great photo on WhatsApp. Um, I know it's not on your slides, but have a look and maybe show everybody on your camera, like hold it up. <laughs> it's actually such a good description of showing exactly how close they all are and exactly the bacteria. It's just to me, this made me understand almost everything I needed to about UTIs. I was like, that's how it happens. <laughs> yes. Okay. Let's see if I can do this here. Let's see if you can see here. Okay. So what we have is, so I know it's kind of small. Um, this is our vagina, our urethra and our anus. Like we're not talking a whole lot of space in through this area, right? Like we're talking just, you know, if you feel that space in between, there's not a lot of room. So anything that's going on down there is part of this whole connection. And so this was kind of one of the things that I was starting to notice that women were getting UTIs and then they were having all these cases of bacterial vaginosis because it was the vaginosis that I, I noticed, I discovered first here in Bermuda. And then I started digging deeper and researching. I'm like, what is going on? And I knew that the gut microbiome was so important. And then I said, well, what about the vaginal microbiome? If it's not in balance, then what is it doing to the UTIs? And then we're starting to see that connection. So which slide do I have? Uh, no, I didn't put one. I didn't put one for the bacterial vaginosis, but basically if our vagina is meant to be at a specific pH. And I remember years ago, I was abroad and I think I had to get a yeast pill or something, but in the little packet came a piece of litmus paper. If you remember that from science class and it said to check the pH of your vagina. And so what goes on through many of the same mechanisms that are going on with bladder infections and painful bladder syndrome is that we're seeing that the pH of the vagina is getting out of balance. 
And this bacteria vaginosis, which some of you probably heard about if you had a, something on your pap test, it starts to grow. Because remember our body, like these bugs, like E. coli lives in us. We've got all the bugs in us. They just kind of go into a balance. It's like the, the bad outweigh the good. And so if bacterial, if, you're, if you're, um, your vagina is out of balance, you're gonna get an overgrowth of bacterial vaginosis, but it does a lot of nasty things. Now, this is not a talk about HPV, but there are actually studies now, because I was looking at this two weeks ago, because I said, well, what happens if your vagina is out of balance? What's that gonna do to your cervix? What's it gonna do to HPV, which is the virus that causes a cervical cancer. So now we know the research supports that if you have an imbalance of flora in your vagina, you are more prone to get cervical cancer from HPV. And, and think wow, about- Wow, that's powerful. Like yeah. this makes a lot of sense. Like for those, you know, I get cold sores. So think about it. If you get a cold sore, like I get them with stress and sun and alcohol and sugar, right? So the same thing is going on in your vagina. So you have another virus, which is called HPV. And when you, when your vagina gets out of balance, when you get stressed, when you're not eating well, that's going to cause that HPV to cause inflammation of your cervix. And then if that keeps happening again and again and again and not being treated, then it can cause cervical cancer. But the big link here is when it comes to UTIs, that if you on your pap test or if you have a vaginal swab, if it shows something called a shift in vaginal flora, then one of the things that you really need to work on from the treatment aspect is you need to get your vaginal microbiome back in balance. And so there's, we'll talk about, there's some products that you can do along with, you know, getting your whole system back in balance again. So remember, we're working in that little two or two inch space down there. So think about that, the vaginal microbiome and its impact on UTIs. The next one is a new sexual partner or just sex in general, okay? So when we think of sex, so we think of the friction, right? We're thinking about that and all these germs going back and forth. But the other thing to think about is the semen, okay? Because even though you are in balance, if your partner has some issues or just like, you know, for us, if we feel it, if we don't, if we have too much sugar and we don't, and we drink too much alcohol, well, what if your partner does those things? It's going to affect his, your, his sperm. That sperm is going to go inside. Number one, we know that that contributes to changes in the vaginal microbiome. And so that can be another thing to consider is looking at your partner's, oh, looking at your partner's health and not just I don't think they did this the last time. Uh, I don't know why. Oh, here. Sometimes it. Uh... Sorry, guys. I'll be right back here again. I don't know why it's showing my messages because they were closed. Let's just put out here. Okay. This is like the story of COVID. Everyone with the technology, we're all like, oh, wait, how? <laughs> it's so or the funny. quote of the year was, you're on mute. <laughs> I didn't touch anything. Okay. <laughs> um, so one thing to consider. So getting your boyfriend or partner, husband, whatever, getting them checked to see, could there be something going, like we know that, of course, STDs are something to consider. This is kind of beyond STDs. But is there something there, if it's always sexual, could it be a problem with your partner? The next one I want to talk about is hormones. So we think about this um, in terms of, we all know now there's a, a push and there's a, a kind of a movement actually for women to get off of the birth control pill. And I'm actually, I'm really, I'm really happy when girls come in and ladies come in and they say, I don't really want to be on it because I've been reading so much and it's not that great for me. And it is true, right? Because birth control pills are, um, they're estrogen and progesterone that's not bioidentical. Um, it's not meant to be in our bodies. So when we look at birth control pills, did you know this? Interstitial cystitis or painful bladder syndrome in premenopausal females is precipitated, it's brought on 
by oral combined contraceptives, right? So what's happening, you know, with um, the birth control pill, it's shifting the balance of estrogen and progesterone, and that actually begins to shift the vaginal microbiome. So this can be one of the other things that we need to consider. Now, I spoke about a bit about birth control, but we also know that many women now are suffering from estrogen-based issues, okay? So remember our big female hormones, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. So many women are now estrogen dominant. Part of this happens because we have a lot, a lot of toxic skincare products we put on ourselves. We take in a lot of you know, animal proteins, like you said, milk and dairy, we're getting a lot of extra cow hormones that are not natural for our body. So that can have an impact. So what is it doing? So this, actually, I just saw this one today. I, I knew about estrogen, but there's actually this interstitial, interstitial cystitis network. And um, they brought it up on their page because I was just looking for a little bit more slides to show you guys, but this is it. So excess estrogen, but also estrogen deficiency, because a lot of times what we see as women get closer to menopause, and, and I'm seeing this a lot, you know, now when women come in for their pap test, I start to see, you know, our vaginas, they're nice and pink and they're healthy when we're young. But when you start turning 45, 50, 55, 60, the walls literally thin right out, you know, and sometimes I put a speculum in it and it's so thin. And so what happens here is you can actually have a deficiency as you go through menopause, that's a natural state. And so some women, as they go through menopause, if they're actually given um, either estrogen, like Vagifem, uh, which is a, an intravaginal estrogen, which would be one of the safer ones to use, or something called DHEA, which is another um, hormone that can be given to help to strengthen the wall of the vagina, that can help those women that are going through menopause symptoms and also getting recurrent UTIs. Um, pelvic floor dysfunction. Did you read up about that, Amanda, or hear anything about that? Yes. Oh my gosh. So this is absolutely brand new to me as in I'm talking a couple weeks ago. Um, I, and suddenly, you know, how our phones are listening. I've been getting ads on like Instagram being like to train your brain and this, um, it's almost like an association. So like now sometimes if I have sex, it will not now, but like when I was getting really bad, um, it, it was like almost an association. And so the brain response was like trained to be like, okay, we know we're going to get a U UTI, but actually it was, and it would mimic the symptoms anyway. I, I, and then I've just learned, followed somebody on YouTube who is a, um, pelvic floor physio, um, is that, oh my gosh, what are they called? Yeah. Physio. Well, she's a physio. And can assist with this. And this is all brand new to me. I'm like, I'm going to probably fly to England just so she can help me. Um, so yeah, this is brand new to me. So I'd love to hear what you have to say about this because it's very interesting. It is. So anything, so again, you're talking about like, first is the triggered response. You know, it's like with men, one of the reasons that men that have ever had troubles getting erections and they can actually then get a psychological response because their mind just goes there. So when we have a repeated pattern, if you know, I'll always get after sex, you're telling your body, you're going to always get it after sex, right? Mm -hmm. so yep. <laughs> changing the thinking is one, but the other is there's so much that goes on in the pelvic floor from the musculature itself, from training the bladder, like, um, you know, teaching the bladder good techniques. You know, some women have had uh, bladder infections because they're nurses and their bladder gets distended all the time because they don't want to go to the bathroom or school teachers that, you know, they never take the time to go pee. And so you actually have to then retrain mm -hmm. your bladder <laughs> as to how to get it back on, on track again. Um, but women that have had any, if you've had a baby, right? So those muscles get really weak and they need to be tightened again. They need to be retrained. You know, many women have had, you know, vaginal tears that have happened. So that pelvic floor uh, working in those areas can really play a significant role for many women. The other thing, as I'll talk about kind of pelvic floor going into gut, 
you know, we think about pelvic floor. So something like chronic constipation, right? If you're constipated all the time, you have a lot of stool that's sitting there in your rectum, okay? So number one, there's a greater chance that those bacteria are gonna go up into the urethra. But also sometimes the pressure of all that stool sitting in there in the bladder is just gonna make the, you know, the bladder from a painful perspective go have more chance to go into spasm. And this can be a problem. I've seen this, um, I never used to think about it in women, but I would see this in men because sometimes in the hospital, we would have a man come in that went into you know, retention. So he couldn't pee. So we had to put a catheter in his bladder, but then we do a rectal check and you find out that he's full of stool, right? And so that was the reason he couldn't pee because he's chronically constipated, but it can play a role in women's health as well. Um, and then what about the gut? So of course we have to talk about the gut. It's one of our biggest microbiomes. So what sort of things did you come across there, Amanda? Did it in your reading? Ooh, I, do you know what? I don't know much about the gut itself. For me, it was a matter of like the food allergies. Um, so that's something I'd love to hear more about from you because I know this is something that you are very into. Right. Yeah, and so basically anything along these tracks, right? Um, I had a, a lady in today in the office and um, she was sweating a lot. And I asked her, well, does your sweat stink? Does it smell bad? And she said, yes, because she has gut dysbiosis. And uh, sadly, you know how I had to learn this? This is what we do in medicine. So I've had problems with my gut, right? I've shared this. I have had leaky gut. I had a lot of candida. And so much of my life, I had bad body odor, okay? And there's nothing more embarrassing than this. And what I found is that when the candida would come back, when I would get out of balance, that's when my body order would get out of balance as well. So anything that's going on inside us is going to affect us. It affects our breath, it affects our smell, but it's also gonna check the vagina and the bladder. So the gut is all completely uh, connected. When the gut is out of balance, it's going to cause a lot of inflammation. And one of the things that we know about many of these conditions you know, they're inflammatory in nature. So what does inflammation mean? It means that there's pain that's going on. So if you have a leaky gut, like if you have irritable bowel syndrome, if you have Crohn's or colitis, if you're not having regular poops every day, then you need to work on getting that back in balance as much as you need to work on getting the vagina back in balance. And so that ties into the next one, which are mast cells as well. So when we talk about food, and you brought that up, Amanda, that you know that there's some foods that will trigger. So you mentioned tomatoes. So tomatoes for many people are, tomatoes are of the nightshade family, right? So tomatoes, potatoes, um, peppers, and eggplant. So that can be a trigger. But for many individuals, it goes even deeper. And it actually goes into this whole syndrome called mast cell activation syndrome. Have you heard about that one? I spoke to this girl on the plane ride leaving Bermuda. She was a tourist visiting and I was explaining to her all my issues. And she said that she, and she told me all about MCAS and I don't remember, but I had said, I started to look into it. And I, at the time, this was years ago, I didn't find much on it. Um, but yeah, this is funny that it's coming up again. So yeah, yeah I wanna learn some more here. It's, it's huge. And I'm going to see if I shared a slide on that one. Let's see. Birth control. We had the estrogen. No, we just went into prevention. I knew mast cells is a whole other topic on itself, but there's a lot of, um, I always like to do some research before I come on just to see what is the latest, you know, that we know. And there is a lot of, um, there's a lot of talk now in the whole urology spectrum of saying, we have to look at other, we have to be open to other methods, other avenues. What is really going on here? You know, we look at things like endometriosis. We know that that's autoimmune. When we look at things like interstitial cystitis and all these pain, there are other autoimmune components, but what about this whole concept of mast cell activation syndrome? So a lot of times the reason that certain foods will bother you, whether if it's your gut or it's your, you know, your vagina, or if it's your bladder, it's because they're stimulating a mast cell response. So think about mast cells as histamine. 
So most of us have probably have hives at one point. You know, hives are like a big welt you get on your arm. Sometimes it, you think of it if you have an allergy to an antibiotic, but other times you might brush up against a plant and you can see this hive that comes out on your skin. So the hives are histamine and histamine is released from a mast cell. So there can be inherited disorders. And I'm glad you brought that up with your family, Amanda, because I'm going to put genetics at this mm. slide as well, because there are inher inherited dis disorders of histamine metabolism. And then what happens is you don't break down histamine well. And so that can lead to problems like bladder infections. It can lead to problems like allergies as well. And it can lead to a whole host of problems like chronic fatigue syndrome. And that can be summed up in this whole mast cell activation syndrome. So that's a whole other topic for a whole other night. But it's very interesting that they are looking more closely to see how the, what the role is association here with the bladder. That's great that they're doing that because that's the one thing that I keep hearing repeated everywhere is that there's they we don't know like the medical community doesn't truly understand why some women are prone to UTIs and get them all the time uh, or even just you know a couple times a year and then there's some women who just don't get them at all who I call unicorns <laughs> <laughs> whenever I meet make a new friend I'm like have you ever had a UTI no I'm like oh you the unicorn <laughs> <laughs> so rare <laughs> like wow <laughs> magical but yeah so that's really cool to hear that they're you know looking beyond and trying to find another reason so then in terms of prevention okay so let's just talk about prevention or treatment but you know water of course and so you said you're up to four liters a day right yeah. yep and it helps with the um uh bowel movements as well it's funny that I only at my last urologist appointment learned about what you were saying with the stool. So I was always backed up um, since a child. And I wonder if it's because of the water, but I wonder also if there's something else there that contributes to the UTIs. So, um, but water has also helped with the bowel movements. Right. And so again, this whole thing, so making sure your bowels are moving, you know, looking for any sort of dysfunction, getting constipation, get that sorted. Um, but this would also fall, fall under the whole category of really looking at your gut. And if you have IBS yep. and interstitial cystitis, then you really need to kind of go hardcore, um, probably looking at, you know, maybe even advanced testings or doing a full gut reset uh, with a lot of additional supplements. So we'll talk about a few things. Uh, vaginal atrophy. So again, this was um, what I spoke about before about women as they get menopausal. So for preventing UTIs for those women, looking at actually the estrogen, okay? Or um, again, DHEA, which would be another alternate uh, to help them if they, if they just started getting UTIs when they became, went through menopause. Uh, and you think about two women that have had early hysterectomies, right? Because some of those women start to lose their hormones. Um, the nutrition component of things. So we know that inflammatory foods, we know that sugars, uh, we know that alcohol. Now, Amanda, you said you actually had an allergy test done. What kind of test did you have? Yeah, um, just like you said, how important the gut is and the bowels. So that's what led me to do that. I went to the Bermuda Allergy Clinic. I believe it's the only one. Um, but actually, I think you can do it at North Shore Medical now too, is what I've heard. But um, yeah, I had, since a child, I'd had lots of allergies and got tested for the six major food groups, egg, soy, um, all this, but I knew something was still wrong. And so I went back as an adult and I said, I, I, I need, I want to get tested and, and she very helpful. And they said that they could actually, I could pick which foods I, if I had a suspicion. So I literally got to pick which foods I was going to be tested for. Now, crazy enough, milk was not on the basic six, which I was shocked to learn. And I wonder if that's something to do with the whole dairy industry and profitability, but um, because dairy is such a common allergy, but it was not considered one of the main six. And had I figured that out when I was a child, I could have saved myself a lot of pain. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, they were great at the Bermuda Allergy Clinic. And I got, I found out bananas, almonds, random things. Um, so I stay away from them. And the dairy is the biggest one. And 
yeah, I, I noticed again, that was major contributing factor to my success of like the UTI for three years. Um, so that was great. So the one thing with nutrition, that's it, it's trying to find out the source. Now, in some individuals, even with some of the allergy testing, if you are inflamed at the time, sometimes things will show positive on your allergy test. It doesn't mean you have to avoid them forever and ever, right? For, for some individuals, yeah. which is part of the reason why a lot of times I'll get people just to go on an elimination diet, you know, like the gut reset, like, and then bring the food back in. Sometimes, sometimes that can be beneficial as you bring them one-on-one -on -one, um, to kind of look at your response to it as well. Um, so nutrition, so d manos, which we'll talk about in the next slide, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about probiotics. So because of this whole connection between the vagina and the bladder, so it's, I think it's really important for any women that's having this issue to make sure that they get some vaginal swabs done and start seeing, uh, looking for any links here. So you can actually get a probiotic um, of lactobacillus and it's called Kness Balance or Balance Active. And it goes in your vagina. It's kind of like most of us have used like a, a yeast preparation. You kind of put these little jelly tubes on at night um, and basically, they're able to see that this can actually reduce the number of UTIs. So this article was, um, I think I might have even got this from Eucora, but they did actually a double blinded, like a proper like research study. And they found a reduction in UTIs with this intravaginal probiotic. So that's pretty impressive too, right? That you're putting a probiotic. It's like putting, think of it as you're putting like this yogurt in your vagina a properly balanced one, and it's actually decreasing the recurrence rate for bladder infections. Wow. So another one. I've never heard of that. Very cool. Thank you. You're welcome. So then I think we've just got, oh, that's the other advanced ones, but d -manos. Okay. So d -manos, again, I didn't really know a lot about this except for about two years ago, I guess. Um, and when you look at it now, it's like, wow, this is really good stuff. So tell us how much you're taking, Amanda, and how this is, this powder. Yeah, yeah, I I wish maybe on the next slide or something, I could go get my uh, Eucora pills to have a look. So I don't I don't know the exact amount, but I'm on um, a product called Eucora and it's like a three-step program and they help address the biofilm, which we spoke about earlier. Um, and the main source though is, is uh, or main ingredient is d -manos for, preventative so they've got like these emergency sachets you pour in a glass of water um so i don't know the dosage but d manos has been really good that this is a game changer i have a friend uh her brother is a naturopath so um i don't know how to describe exactly what that is but um a doctor but through a different route not quite medical doctor that we see it as but anyway he told his sister my friend about it and since she started taking them, she's not had a UTI since, which is what a success story. I mean, like powerful stuff. I'm jealous because I definitely still <laughs> got them since taking, but this is, I mean, d has saved me so many times when I was like, oh, you know, when you're on the verge of a UTI, and you're like, oh, I can feel it, but it's not there yet. I'm just going to chug my water and like take my d -manos and it's, yeah, it can really, it saved me from being like teetering on the edge to full-blown UTI. Yeah, it's amazing. And really like this study, if you look at this was 2014. And I don't think even now a lot of doctors, like again, I'm kind of in this world of trying to learn the nutrition. So these are some of the things we have to share with our friends, you know, that have UTI. Yep. Um, but yep. you know, it's actually a prebiotic, right? It's a sugar, right? So it's a carb, it's a starch. But the way that it goes in into the bladder it allows, um, it really helps to balance the pH as things go through there. And it's just helping to create a healthier microbiome, right? So in this study, they use two grams a day. And um, I'm trying to think what I have, because I have a big bottle here, because I actually, you know, I was starting to see much, so much benefit. I have it now at the office, Amanda, because I got our pharmacist to bring it in. Because That's I sent, fantastic. Yeah, I sent women all around town looking for it. Um, I think the dosage, I think three tablets is 1.5 grams and you can take it anywhere from one to three times a day is what the bottle says. 
Now, for people, for those of you that are out there that perhaps, you know, you're thinking, well, well if I just have a bladder infection tomorrow, what can I do? d if you just take that, it can actually stop your bladder infection, right? In the very throes, in the very beginnings. Exactly. And yeah, daily as well. I think it daily is part of the regime. And then, yep, like you said, right before you think you're going to get one, you, you take like a high dose of it. Um, yeah, too and it's delicious. They make it um, into a nice uh, drink. <laughs> it's like a pink lemonade, the one I have. Yeah, the Eucora one looks good. The ones that we have is just good. the capsules, but at least you get it in. Yeah. Those are great. Yep, yeah, I use those. So then if we look at, and so if we look at other treatments, yeah. uh, I'm just going to, just because usually we try to end up at nine o'clock, but you know, there are other, and I'm just going to let you close with Eucora too, Amanda, but just additional treatments that there are so many other uh, things that can be offered. Of course, we spoke about the stress, the mind-body connection, right? Um, acupuncture can be beneficial because for many women, especially if they have a lot of pelvic floor dysfunction, and it, it can help to settle things. Acupuncture in general can help to settle the vagus nerve and just to calm the system down. For women that have a lot of pain, low-dose naltrexone can be there, um, which is, you know, I prescribe in a lot of, some doctors prescribe, but a lot of naturopaths can prescribe it as well. And then this whole thing about starting to look at oxalates and histamines. So this comes about with this whole mast cell activation syndrome. And then these are just, uh, I just put up some of the typical foods that we see with oxalates or, or histamines. But this is kind of the whole, like, I wanted to cover today, like the basics of what it's like, what we have been told, but some of the intermediary stuff that we can do, and then even more advanced things that we, uh, that we can do. Um, so I think that was it for my slides, but Amanda, just if you can, just tell us a little bit more as well about Eucora, and then we'll just open it up if there's any more questions. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Fantastic job with all those slides, all this information. I got to look back on this if you could send me the recording, by the way. Um, yeah. Um, Eucora is really good. They, uh, I believe they actually might be Canadian. Um, they, they, it's a three-step system. I am not paid advertising, by the way. This is all just because I really love it. Um, they have a probiotic, which you take daily, just like Dr. Keenan was saying. Um, it's really important for like the balance in the vagina. Um, and then there is also the microbiome pill, which is daily as well. Um, so it, I don't know how it does it, but it like cleanses the, my, the bio, biofilm that we discussed where the bacteria can be hidden. And then the third one, you could take it daily. Some people opt to buy um, a daily version of it um, or you take it on emergency. And that's a little sachet that I mentioned with you pour it into a drink and um, some water and it's like a nice uh, pink lemonade, but that is just straight up D manos um, and maybe a few other um, things that we, I don't know if we spoke about, but yeah, it's a great system. I really like it. The only issue was they were having a lot of problems shipping to Bermuda with me. It kept coming to DHL, but and I got to pay extra. We've sorted it out for the most part. Um, but yeah, I can send maybe, yeah, the name UQ. O-R-A, I believe is how it's spelled. Yeah, I didn't put it up. I should have yeah. put it up. And again, neither yeah. of us get any type of reimbursement, but it's just such a wonderful yeah. company and it's a great source of educating yeah. um, people about bladder infections, right? hundred percent. I love reading all their, their materials. And it's like, I've been in touch with Zoe, the owner. She like messages me directly now because we've been talking about shipping. And it's so nice to be like, she's a girl just like me and other people who have dealt with this. and. Yeah, it's, it's a really cool company. I've been enjoying them. Well, that's great. Um, and there was one, someone had mentioned uh, apple cider vinegar can help individuals with UTIs. And I think, again, that comes back to the, uh, I mean, you know, we've heard traditionally for years, cranberry, right? But uh, mm -hmm. the goes kind of above and beyond cranberry. Yes. Like oh, yes. And, and yep. the as well. Mm -hmm. But I think apple cider vinegar, again, it's a probiotic as well, or it's, it's a uh, probiotic right? Because if you get live apple cider vinegar, and it's probably, again, helping with the microbiome, also with the pH of the bladder itself. Love that. So does anyone have any questions for us? I 
everyone, did we cover most things? It was quite, <laughs> I think we went into quite a bit. <laughs> I have a question. <laughs> um, the, what we're talking about the pelvic floor and I had mentioned that there's like a physio person that I had been following on YouTube. Do you know if that exists in Bermuda? Yes, her um, name is Michelle Monk. I don't have a pen. Michelle Monk, okay. Michelle Monk. Write that Monk. in my notes. And in New Brunswick, we have a lady as well uh, in Moncton, New Brunswick. And I wonder if I remember her name. Because yeah, I'd like to, does she come down to Bermuda? Maybe she does <laughs> for <a> session. <laughs> right, okay. But apparently Michelle has been doing this um, for quite some time here in Bermuda. Katie That's Kelly, great to know. The lady in Moncton in New Brunswick is Katie yeah. Kelly. And um, she's a physiotherapist there that does it. But it's actually, you know, as we start learning more about the pelvic floor women, like there's so much to know. And it's not Kegel exercises, right? Um, oh, and we have someone in Bathurst, Nadia Kenny. Perfect. I'm going to put her name down. I'm literally sitting here doing Kegel exercises like, oh, it's not? Okay, I'll relax. Well, Kegels are the beginning, <laughs> but these ladies take it much more in depth than that. Like, yeah, there's so much that can be done. Yeah, from what I saw on YouTube, if I could maybe share, I forget the name now, but I did the little subscribe thing so she comes up. I, and just the massages in different ways. And she said that she can teach you how to do them yourself and you can help yourself when you're having like a flare up if you're say on vacation or something. Well, that I got be good. I got something called a cooch ball. <laughs> it's like a mini. It sounds fun. <laughs> it's like this big. No, I must say, I, I, I sign up all these things, right? But I haven't tried it out, but you're supposed to sit there. It's just like you're balancing like on a big, you know, the, the athletic balls. But this little yeah. guy is only this big. And I guess you're supposed to, I don't know, rock and roll on it. <laughs> wow. I'll have to look but this up too. It's a mini course that someday I have to, I sign up for these things and someday I have to take it. So but, I, but one of the people I did want to have on this call um, was a pelvic floor person, because I think for women, it's such a, it's a condition that's not discussed. And there's so many more things that we can be doing. There's so many women that have painful sex that don't, you know, that have no options. Again, they're told it's all in their head. Um, but there's a lot that can be done uh, in that region of our body. Well, everybody, thank you so much. This has been great. Amanda, it's been wonderful to have you uh, on here with us and to really just to share your story because I think we learn so much by knowing that we're not alone, right? That we all can go through similar conditions and, it's, um, and it, it really takes it to the point where we have to say, that's it, it's my body. I'm gonna do the work, I'm gonna do the research and cause I wanna feel better and, and that's what you did. And, yeah. And now look at you. You're jumping out of planes and throwing fire in the air. <laughs> Going on Saturday for the planes as well. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, no, it's been so great. I absolutely love that you do this and just offer and have this chat. You're so right. It's so good to be heard. And that's what, when I hit rock bottom was when I felt the most alone and when it was the worst. So yeah, it's good for us all, like as women and men, if they get them too, you know, but just to all just talk about this and other topics. I'm so excited to know you do this. So I'm going to join for your other sessions. Cool. Um, maybe we do the MCAS or yeah, but thank you. Thanks for having me on. And everybody who gets UTIs, like you are not alone. You can message me anytime if you're just feeling horrible and we can like bitch about it together. <laughs> but yeah, honestly, um, oh, thank you, right. Dr. Keenan. You're fantastic. This was so helpful. Like yeah, I'm going to be booking an appointment to maybe work on some things like with the gut. So yeah, when I'm back, I'll message. Sure, we can do that. So thanks yeah. again. And we'll just close up everyone. Did I put it in my chat here? I strive daily. We have a little quote that we finish up with Amanda. Um, oh, I love I it. In my groups in Canada. So you can feel free to, to say it along or just to, um, just to follow along. I strive daily toward my higher self. I realize that my life, my health, and my weight is a journey and not a destination. I take pleasure in my daily successes. I'm resilient toward the challenges that I face along my journey. I surround myself with supporters to help me become a better version of me. That's beautiful. Thank you all so much, everybody. And uh, we'll see you all again next week. Have a great week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.